60 years ago, Queen's University in Kingston decided to honor Canada's first Prime Minister by putting his name on its law school. It made perfect sense since Sir Johnny Macdonald got his start as a lawyer in Kingston. But 60 years later, Macdonald's legacy is, shall we say, more complicated. And that's now led the university to the decision to remove Macdonald's name from the law school. It raises a host of questions to explore with our guests, whom we'll introduce as is our custom here on the agenda from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in the nation's capital with Jeffrey Simpson, the senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. In Kingston, Ontario, Mark Walters, the dean of the law school at Queen's University. And in our provincial capital, Melanie Newton, associate professor of Caribbean and Atlantic world history at the University of Toronto. And I'm uh, pleased to welcome all three of you uh, to the agenda. I think two of you for the first time. Jeffrey Simpson, good to see you again. Dean Walters, just get us started here with some background. What prompted the university to consider taking Sir John A. Macdonald's name off the law school building in the first place? Sure. I mean, the issue of Macdonald's name has been one that on uh, on the agenda, sorry, um, for a few years now. Um, the, the triggering factor probably was a petition submitted to the Board of Trustees in June uh, asking for the name to be removed and uh, uh, a consultation process followed uh, various recommendations made uh, and these were all put to the board of trustees um, on uh, october 19th and it made the decision to uh, to remove the name um, so uh, a consultation process leading to recommendations and a decision let me follow up on that consultation process because in your report you do point out that you did an online survey and uh, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up those numbers right now because you asked the question, do you believe that the law school building should continue to be named Sir John A. Macdonald Hall? You surveyed nearly 3,000 people, and yes, keep the name as is, came back with 47% support. No, drop the name, was it just a touch over 50% support? Then you surveyed law school alumni who answered the survey, Yes, keep the name, 44%. No, drop the name, 38%. But of the current law school students, yes, keep the name, only 21%. No, drop the name, 58%. So the question is, how useful, uh, Mark, was all of that information to the university making its ultimate decision? Right. So, uh, you know, I think we all appreciated going into this that there, this was a question that would divide people um, and it came out as dividing people almost down the middle. Um, though, as you just noted, law school alumni tended to favor keeping the name. Now, this was a, an interesting fact in, in how we, uh, we understood the responses. It, it seemed that uh, uh, the graduates up to about the year 2000 tended to favor keeping the name and then thereafter tended to favor removing the name. So there seemed to be a generational divide here. And then we turned to present students, but also faculty member and staff within the law school. Uh, an overwhelming majority tended to want to dename the building. Um, and, and uh, you know, in the end, your question, how do you uh, reach a conclusion on the basis of those numbers? You know, in the it really wasn't a matter of numbers. Uh, it's not just a matter of tallying up votes on one side or the other but coming to a reasoned decision on the basis of principle. And um, so that's how we approached it in the end. Melanie Newton, what's your view of what the university has decided to do? Um, I think it reflects uh, the changing sentiment about the role that um, this kind of naming process and monuments and street names play, that it's not changing these names is not quote unquote changing history it is acknowledging that history in a fuller and richer way. And that the naming, choosing to name something after John A. Macdonald is um, to choose to constantly reenact the fact that he was such a crucial figure in the history of residential schools. Jeffrey Simpson, before I get you to weigh in on what you think of the decision, maybe you could just tell us off the top, you do have a rather deep connection to Queen's University, do you not? I have. What is it? Oh, gosh, I was a student there. I had a wonderful undergraduate education in history and political science. I was one of the first student senators. I was a um, winner of the Tricolor Award. I have been a fellow there. I've been a distinguished visitor. 
I was a member of the Board of Trustees. I was, uh, I have an honorary degree from Queens. Um, I am the permanent president of Art 71, the position I trying to resign from, but they won't let me because I was elected. So I've been involved in Queens for the better part of 50 years in different iterations. And it breaks my heart to see what they've done because um, this is what I call presentism. You can use other phrases. Presentism is where you have a certain view of society today and how it should be organized, and how it should have values that you agree with. And you project back 100, 150 years and say, why didn't they act then as we would act today? This distorts history completely. Put it another way, Steve, we're having a discussion today, November 2020, we all have worked for or worked at certain institutions. We don't spend any time nor can we spend any time thinking about what 150 years from now people will think about what we did today. Maybe the next generation, but not five or six generations from now. It's impossible to know what Canada will be like, what the world will be like 150 years from now. We can only think about our contemporary circumstances, which is exactly what was happening to Sir John A. Macdonald and all the men, and they were men who were in public life at that time. So to retroactively condemn, and by the way, if you take somebody's name off a building, you're condemning, that's not a neutral act. You're making a strong political statement. You are doing something which I call presentism, which distorts the past. I'm all for adding, and there were compromises available here. But unfortunately, it wasn't quite as simple as the Dean has said. The principal of the university very much wanted this to happen and started sending messages to the university community, and I get them, uh, about uh, what I call presentism, quoting Karl Marx and uh, all the buzzwords of today. And by the way, I've served for 15 years on university boards, six at Queens and nine somewhere else. I have some sense of how university government wants, works. And in those 15 years, Steve, I have never, and I went through my adult memory about this, I have never known a board to stand up and say no to a principal who really wants them. So the principal well, wanted I could this see and this got come, I could see this coming a long time before it actually happened. But the only thing that shocked me in all of this is that at the law school, the professors voted 29 to 3. That's a 95% vote. That's like a fellow Russian election. I mean, you professors, I love them, but they are so hard to work, uh, to, to herd together. They can barely agree that there's, today is Monday. But in this case, the howling winds of presentism swept through the law school and the vote was 90, 29 to three. Think of the chilling effect that has on whatever students might not have agreed with the mighty 29. Okay, so, I'm guessing, Jeffrey, your colleagues here want to have at that. Uh, Mark Walters, can you, can you speak, first of all, to the issue of presentism? You are making a decision uh, today, well, okay, you just heard Jeffrey Simpson's argument, so why don't you take a hit at it? Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, I don't see it as presentism at all. Uh, quite, quite the contrary. Um, the decision is made in one sense on the basis of the present values, aspirations, and um, and character of the law school community in the building. There's no question about that. Um, the name building sends a signal to the world about the kind of community in that building and it and the the reality is and it is a present reality that name was getting in the way of certain basic values and principles that we cherish here and i'll just name two one uh reconciliation between indigenous and non-indigenous people in canada and two the value of diversity and inclusion in a university environment and uh, I'll, I'll just be blunt, uh, I had many, many Indigenous students uh, say to me, and they said to the advisory committee during the consultation process, how can you say that you are welcoming us into your law school to study law when the name on the building is the name of somebody who initiated a policy which had a devastating effect on our communities and these are students, uh, some of whom will have had parents and grandparents in residential schools and uh, who suffered as a result. Now, I, I, it would be presented to say 
uh, McDonald is responsible for everything that occurred in the 80 or 90 years after he initiated the policy. But the fact of the matter is that is how people felt and feel today about the name on the building. And, um, and uh, you know, he was indeed the minister responsible for Indian affairs when the policy was introduced. Uh, that's a fact. I'm, I'm not changing history there. I'm not rewriting anything. Um, he was the minister responsible for the policy that proved devastating for Indigenous people uh, in, in the subsequent history. All right, let me get Melanie Newton on this part then. If, if the idea is to improve issues around inclusion and reconciliation, based on your knowledge of when this kind of thing is done in other areas, does it actually move the yardsticks forward on those two issues to remove names, change street names, et cetera, et cetera? The simple answer is yes. First of all, I think the conversation that we're having now is entirely because people made this demand and the demand was finally heard um, in the context of everything that has happened this year in terms of thinking about questions of systemic racism. That's why we're having this conversation. So the conversation itself is productive and we would not be having it if that demand, which has existed for quite a long time, to change, to rethink this, these kinds of names was not out there. So this is a, an institutional response to a sentiment that is not new. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that the, um, the, on the question, of course, I don't know anything about the specific details of the decision-making process at Queen's, but I would call, if there was that kind of um, encouragement from the president and a sign of how the president of the university felt that this, this was something that needed to happen, I would call that leadership. And I would say it is the kind of ethical leadership that does take a position on this question. Of course, it's, you know, and, and saying that this is what the university thinks ought to happen. So I would see that a little bit differently. And I do think actually it's a sign of the kind of leadership that we would want from our intellectual institutions in the society to say that this is impo important. Um, and then a last point on this question of the fact, the idea that it's presentism, you know, I'm not teaching the same textbooks to my students that say someone who is teaching the history of imperialism would have been using 25 years ago. The conversation changes and that conversation includes what happens in our classrooms. It also includes what happens in our public spaces. So we should not be assuming that it is somehow a bad thing or all the institutions of society will fall if, as a society, we engage in those conversations and look at what aspects of our history do we choose to celebrate in public. Are they adequate for the kinds of conversations that we are having with that past? That is not presentism. History is a conversation between the past and the present. That does not mean that you can change past events, obviously not. But the conversation does change. And it's really important for all of our institutions to have that kind of sophisticated understanding of history. So the idea that somehow a monument once erected must stand forever is like, it's the same as suggesting that, you know, a textbook that someone was using 50 years ago, um, it was good enough for then, it's good enough for now. It's, it's just not... It's not the way, it's not a healthy way to engage. But, but I think Jeffrey Simpson's point was, uh, it, of course, history changes and we reinterpret it as the years go by. But as opposed to subtraction, what about addition? As opposed to taking McDonald's name off the school, could you not name something else at the school after somebody, maybe an indigenous person who had made a great contribution to Canada as well? Why is that not an option? I cannot speak to the specifics of the decision at Queen's University, nor would I say that um, when it comes to these kinds of figures who we come to associate, and I'll speak about the things I know most about, with Indigenous genocide and with slavery, um, I can't... Um, the response has to be the same. It depends on what kind of um, public monument or street, or it depends on what you're talking about. So I think the conversation that is happening in sort of heritage circles around these questions is a lot more complicated um, and in acknowledgement of the fact that not every public commemoration is the same or has to be dealt with the same way. In the specific case of Queen's University, I do think that everything that the Dean just said um, about how this was being understood 
by students um, within the school now is really important. And again, I would stress to change the name of the law school does not change the role of John A. Macdonald in history. Well, let me it's pick up on that if I can with, with uh, Jeffrey Simpson, because your great friend and mine, Richard Gwynn, uh, wrote a couple of books about Sir John A. in which he concluded, no Sir John A., no Canada. So that's a pretty good thing to have on your resume. Having said that, Jeffrey, here's what Sir John A. did say back in the day. If you look around the world, you will see that the Aryan races will not wholesomely amalgamate with the Africans or the Asiatics. It is not to be desired that they should come, that we should have a mongrel race. Now, how do you deal with the unacceptability of those views today with the understandable desire to honor a man who created one of the great countries in the history of the world? There's no question about the fact that MacDonald, like the other white patriarchs of the time, were racist vis-a-vis -vis other than white races. There's no question about that. And they outlawed the potlatch, and they uh, set up residential schools, which they thought, in the way they saw the world, would assist those people in getting an education in the white man's way. I know that there's no question about that. And nobody, to my knowledge, has ever said that that wasn't part of McDonald's legacy and the legacy of all the people at the time, because nobody objected to residential schools that I'm aware of in the historical record. But when you take a name off the building, what you're doing is you're putting basically all your eggs in one interpretive basket, which is what you just showed on the screen. And you're forgetting about the fact that he and the others actually did something, and we're too modest as Canadians to put this in an international context, but I will, which is quite remarkable. Europe was beset by wars between Protestants and Catholics for centuries. There was the famous Hundred Years' War, which was Protestant Catholics, and the French and the English were at each other's throats through much of many hundreds of years. They fought in North America. When Lord Durham came after the rebellions of the 1830s to Canada to investigate what had happened, he found, quote, two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. And yet 30 years later, MacDonald and others put together an improbable thing called a federation in Canada with these two nations that were warring in the bosom of a single state. Now, let me say three quick things about that accomplishment. Number one, Canada is the world's oldest federation, not born in war, and not scarred by a civil war. The Swiss Federation is older, but it was born in a civil war. And we know that the American Federation had a four and a half year bloodbath that killed more Americans than in all of America's other wars combined. Secondly, federations are fragile. They're tough to operate. My friend Melanie may know more, does know more about the Caribbean than I do. She'll know that the West Indies Federation fell apart. Malaysia and Singapore Federation fell apart. Rhodesia and Nyasaland fell apart. The Czech Federation with the Slovaks fell apart. I could go on. So that ours has endured is something of historic international significance. And lastly, and lastly, um, the people who put this together had many people in different parts of the country who didn't want it to happen. And McDonald and those who did prevailed. And here we are, 150 plus years later, with all our faults, recognizing residential schools. There was and there is a compromise. And I'll end by simply saying that in the city of Kingston, there is a big park called McDonald Park. And there is a statue of McDonald there. Various voices in Kingston said, tear it down, put it in a garage somewhere. But the mayor, being a sensible man looking for compromise said, no, he made a huge contribution to Kingston and Canada, perhaps an unparalleled contribution to Canada. So we're keeping the statue, but we're gonna put a plaque there that talks about the residential schools. So if the law school was really interested in compromise instead of the howling winds of presentism, they would have kept the name and they would have had an extensive display in the atrium about the negative things that you just referred to but compromise when the winds of presentism blow goes out the window. Mark Walters, can I get you to comment on that? Why was, why was a compromise not a possible option here? Why was it only keep the name or drop the name? Yeah, uh, let me <clears throat> begin just by saying that, uh, that, that Jeffrey's uh, account of the history is, is pretty accurate. I mean, he, he's uh, outlined the various accomplishments of McDonald and uh, uh, McDonald's generation 
So, uh, but he's also acknowledged the facts of McDonald's uh, policies in relation to indigenous people and, and racial and ethnic minorities. So, um, <clears throat> compromise. Well, it's a bit like um, uh, the the name on a building tends to reinforce a one-dimensional view of the person. It's a celebration, and it doesn't. It's not a really effective method at history or developing a rich and balanced view of history. It was put there in 1960 on the basis of a one-dimensional view of McDonald. Um, and we could put a little footnote or asterisk beside the name, please see the plaque inside. Is that gonna be effective in the long run? Um, and I would ask, you know, would it be effective to address the concerns of indigenous students, for example, or members of racial and ethnic minorities or not? And the answer that we got was no. Um, there are other ways of compromise. We can still have that display case. We can still have plaques inside. In fact, I think we should. Uh, it's not our intention to, to um, erase or rewrite history. Uh, there is a really important history to tell about McDonald. And I just don't think having the name on the building is the effective way to do it at the moment. There are other ways that we can further a rich and balanced understanding of McDonald. Well, let me follow up on that if I can. If I mean, you ask people basically uh, two options, keep the name, ditch the name. What if there had been a third option, which was we're going to keep McDonald's name on the building, but we are going to add, let's say, an indigenous leader's name as well. So henceforth, it will be called McDonald fill in the blank hall. Why was that not offered as an option? Well, I, I think, uh, I guess the, the survey was a, a yes or no answer, but there was also a comment box uh, and people could write in comments and we thought and uh, expected, and in fact, it turned out that many people did offer um, other, other ways of dealing with the issue. Uh, and it did come back to an assessment in the end about the effectiveness of those alternative methods of addressing the question. And the, the final conclusion being that if we really are committed to the ideal of reconciliation, um, it's better to have the name off and the context provided in an alternative method inside the building in some way. The Board of Trustees, by the way, has asked um, the principal to come back with a plan for public education surrounding McDonald's. So this is something that we are tasked with addressing in some method in the months ahead. Jeffrey, you want to come back on that? Uh, two quick points. First of all, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, to which the Dean referred before, is uh, repeatedly cited in the report to the Board of uh, Trustees at Queen's as justification for this action. It's ironic that um, the head of that Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Senator, formerly Judge Murray Sinclair, uh, has said on various occasions he does not favor taking names off buildings and toppling statues because he knows how divisive it can be and that there are other and better ways of coming to terms with the past. So it's interesting that the chair of the very commission that everybody's referring to to justify their actions says don't do things like that. He wasn't referring to Queens, let me be clear. Secondly, you can almost understand why the what I call howling winds of presentism blow in certain elite circles because after all, the prime minister of Canada his office building was called the Langevin block. And he took the name Langevin off the building. Who is Langevin? Hector Langevin, when Cartier died, was McDonald's right-hand man in Quebec. He fought, he fought for Canada in Quebec, where there were many people who did not want Quebec to join Canada. He fought for Canada. And he was minister of public works at a time when it was the third most important portfolio in the government after prime minister, minister of finance. The, we were a country that needed ports, needed roads, needed schools, residential schools included. And when they scoured the history of old Hector, they came up with two paragraphs in which he said racist things against all these other accomplishments. So if the prime minister of Canada is engaging in this kind of activity, it's open sesame for Queens. And by the way, if you're gonna take Langevin's name off buildings and take McDonald's name, better take Cartier's name off Take him off the bridges and the roads. Get rid of him. And when you're finished, McDonald, Cartier, and uh, Langevin and the others at that time, you better move on to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, 
better change that name of the university in Ontario because after all, he didn't do anything about residential schools. Apparently he did nothing good for Canada and get rid of the names of all of his cabinet ministers that taught the country. There's no end to this once the howling winds start blowing. Well, I, I think, Melanie Newton, I need you to speak to that. The fact is, when, when Laurier came into office, he increased the head tax on Chinese coming into the country, I think, by about tenfold. So if you want to look for a troubled legacy there, you will find it. Uh, can I put Jeffrey Simpson's question to you? If, if we're going to um, change the names of things where people in the past might not have stood up to the sensitivities of today, do we have to take basically everybody's name off everything? So, oh, where to start? Um, so I think it's interesting. What I would say is that, so the process that Canada is going through is not new. This process of really rethinking the names of these kinds of figures associated with white supremacist thought um, and its defense has happened in many other parts of the world. I do think um, that here in the Canadian context, there is this, I, I would say that there does seem to be a sort of a deep emotive attachment to some of these figures, even yes. as people recognize the complexity of their legacy. There was not the same, say, deep emotive attachment um, to, um, in, to similar kinds of monuments um, in other places. So I do think that at the center of this, I will say honestly, is a question of race. Um, and that is, that is true, that is a present conversation. But I want to stress that this idea that rethinking whether or not these monuments still have a place in our present life is not about rethinking history. So I would first of all say, so the idea that you would have Sir John A. Macdonald's name and an Indigenous leader's name, I'd be curious to know what Indigenous leader would actually want their name up there with Sir John A. Macdonald. I suspect that would be an extremely short list. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that I understand, obviously, you know, Jeffrey Simpson is knows a lot more about Canadian history than I do. It's not my field of expertise. But I do know imperial history, and I do think that what this opens up is also a, a richer conversation about the context of Canadian federalism, which happened in the same decade and was intimately related to the end of um, the election of representative, uh, representative assemblies, so the taking away of responsible government from the British Caribbean, um, a generation after emancipation. And it was, they were expressly framed in relation to each other, um, so that you have responsible government for white settler colonies, you have authoritarian rule directly from the colonial office for colonies where the populations were predominantly white. So this is a long process that goes on. It includes the, um, the granting of responsible government to Canada, eventually to South Africa and Australia. It's, so it's a longer and more complex history. And I do think that people in this country for a long time were not taught this history. And they were not taught this history because the particular kind of narrative of Canadian Fed Confederation that Sir John A. Macdonald represents was very much celebrated as the basis of state legitimacy. And I do think that in, a, in our own contemporary society, the basis of that legitimacy needs to be thought of in some different ways that actually recognize that the country has changed. Again, it does not change the past. But we do not have to maintain in our public commemorations to constantly celebrate the same values of the past. Um, so it's not, I think, the idea that it's going to change history or that it's an endless pro... You know, I think that that speaks to the deep emotive connection, but it also speaks to some, in some ways to the fact that this complex history, which I was taught in the Caribbean, is not taught here. All right. Having said that, what... having said that, let me put this to Mark Walters, which is, you know, the fact is, this doesn't end any boil water advisories. It doesn't settle any land claims. It doesn't create any jobs on reserves. It is symbolic. And at the end of the day, I wonder, in your view, how important uh, or relevant this symbolism will be, because you said reconciliation is part of the reason for doing it. How important does it really amount to at the end of the day in terms of reconciliation? Sure. <clears throat> no, you're absolutely right. Uh, in a way, removing a name from the building uh, is a very easy step to take. The, the sign was actually taken down over the weekend. It's gone. Um, there, it's done. What have we achieved? 
Um, I, I think in the long, you're, you're absolutely right. If we're interested in reconciliation, we have to take the hard, long road of reconciliation. It's a relationship building exercise. It's, reconciliation is really about building healthy relationships. Um, and that takes a lot of time and effort and change has to be uh, significant. So I guess what I, what, what I would suggest is maybe we've got a point, we're at a point now at Queens in our law school where, where we can legitimately say to Indigenous uh, law students, come here to study uh, because we're interested in pursuing that path of reconciliation and not just Indigenous students, in, uh, it, it, we have to get non-Indigenous students on board too so that they can be uh, leaders uh, of tomorrow in terms of building a, a better, more just, a healthier relationship between the different peoples in Canada. And I'll just say, uh, back to McDonald's achievement, I agree with Jeffrey totally. He, he was able, he and a few others, to unify distinct peoples, French and English, Protestant, Catholic, within a single federation committed to justice and legality. We just want to extend that to other peoples, um, extend it past the moral horizon that limited his ability to see where the principles of constitutionalism that he embraced lead, and they lead down a path of reconciliation. It's a, but it's a long and hard path, and I don't discount the uh, the the challenges ahead. Um, it's a uh, it, it's a uh, it's it's a it's a tough road to 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 take, and um, we just have to keep at it. Well, I literally have just a few seconds left to not only thank the three of you for coming on our program tonight, but uh, I'd also like to say that uh, the three of you showed a great deal of courage coming on. We invited numerous other people to join you three in this discussion, and nobody would. So we understand this is a sensitive discussion, and therefore we thank you for your courageousness in coming on to TVO tonight to talk about it. Jeffrey Simpson, Mark Walters, Melanie Newton, thanks so much for a really uh, important and, may I add, very civil discussion tonight on TVO. Appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.